Hi guys, welcome back to the Sodcast with me, Wendy Sod, your host. If this is your first time here, welcome, and please hit that subscribe button for me. Really supports the channel, and it's free. For all of you others that have already subscribed, thank you, and keep coming back. So, I just am jumping on tonight um, to cover this case that I just seen a couple days ago, and it's not getting a lot of coverage and the family is desperate so I wanted to just get the word out um, so let's get into today's case so today's case is that of Sean Doherty who is a 12 year old boy uh, from Yorktown Virginia and he died under very suspicious circumstances and he was found dead on April 14th 2022 at the family home. So let's get into this a little bit. So um, his he lived in the home with his mom, Ramona, stepdad, Jared, 16-year-old um, sister, Maria, five-year-old brother, and a two-year-old brother. And they were a very active military family. And um, as we all know, military families move a lot, as did they. Um, so like I said, where they were living now was Yorktown, Virginia, but um, Ramona, the mother, had just accepted a job at the Pentagon, so um, they were going to be moving soon. So, um, to tell you a little bit about Sean, um, the family says he was a very happy kid, um, uh, just carefree. He was a simple boy. He loved reading, he loved school, he was a straight-A student, he um, was a musician, um, just an all-around happy boy, they said. And as a matter of fact, um, they had just recently went on a little vacation, they took a Disney cruise, the entire family, to celebrate the kids' good grades and reward them because they were all just great students. And so they had just returned that Sunday from their trip. Um, back to school on Monday, uh, nothing remarkable happens during the school week up until this point uh, when he died on April 14th, which was a Thursday. So on the 14th, um, Sean was in school and he gets released from school at 2.55. He then takes the bus home, which was a very short ride. He arrives to the bus stop where he was dropped off at 302, which was just a few steps away from his house. He gets home, and uh, as he's walking in, he's met by his grandmother, who is rushing around. She says she forgot about an appointment, and at the same time, Ramona, the mother, was pulling in the driveway to pick up Grandma to take her to her appointment. Stepdad, Jared, at this time, he was off, um, I believe, 45 minutes away with the five-year-old boy at a different appointment. So, Mom um, gets Grandma in the car, and she calls uh, Sean's cell phone and says, Hey, this is what's going on. I've got to take Grandma to this appointment. It was unplanned and, you know, blah, blah, blah. Can you please watch the two-year-old? And we shouldn't be very long. The appointment was expected to take around 25 minutes. So at most, they'd be gone around an hour. And he was excited. She said um, that he said he was going to start his homework and he was going to do his chores, which he always set an alarm on his phone to go off around 3.30 to remind him to do his chores. And... So, um, from what the mother said, um, it sounds like Sean did his chores, his homework, and then he uh, was watching TV with a movie in the living room with the two-year-old boy. And the two-year-old boy was asleep on the couch at that time. So, Mom Ramona calls a second time, and she says, hey, can you wake him up? Uh, talking about the baby so that he'll sleep tonight. We don't want him to be up all night. He says, sure, no problem. Um, 
So um, a little bit of time passes and at 327, she calls back again. And just so Sean know that they were taking a little longer than expected and um, to just hang tight. And he had brought up how he was planning on playing video games with his friends that night. And she says, you know, that's okay. Take the baby up with you. Um, set him up on the iPad and you can still play video games with your friends. So he was excited about this, she said, and um, from all we know, that is what he did. So from 327 until 450, when Maria, the 16-year-old um, sister, gets home. She, gets, she had a tennis match, I believe, after school, and so that's why she was a little later. She gets home at 4.50. Um, Mom is still not home yet. Dad's not home yet. Uh, she checks the front door. It is locked. She's pounding. She calls uh, Sean's cell phone a couple times and texts him, and he doesn't answer. So she walks around. Um, there's gates on either side of the house, but from what I understand, um, they don't use one of them. Um, so she walks around, I believe, the left side of the house into the backyard and she is immediately struck with a scene. There's a swing set in the backyard and hanging from that, it appears that there is a body. And she said, you know, all these things are going through her mind. She starts freaking out. Um, and she, you know, calls out to the person and she's not getting an answer. So she starts to kind of walk up to them um, to see if she can get any response. And she realizes that this person hanging is her brother. Just insane. Now, the scene described by the family, and specifically by Maria, um, that she found that day was... She said she remembers looking over and she sees the landscaper who was working in the next yard and he too was standing there staring kind of puzzled like what is going on. Um, she noticed that there was a chair there. She noticed that he was hanging up there and he was facing away from her. He had a bag over his head. Um, he had his arms strapped down very uh, snug to his sides, and he was tied with a belt around. And from what I understand, the belt was buckled um, to the back, and it was very tight, and it was kind of tucked under so there was no tail sticking out. Um, she said he was hanging quite low, and it appeared that the string that was holding him up kind of went under his chin and looped around um, and his glasses were found over to the side broke uh, she said his feet were actually touching the ground a little bit and his uh, <clears throat> his knees were bent she said she then uh, reaches up and she said with three fingers she was able to undo that um, off of his chin and get him down to where she calls 911 and she started CPR as the 911 operator was uh, directing her to do. So as she's doing this, I believe it was around six minutes that she performed, six or nine minutes she performed CPR on him um, while she was waiting for the paramedics to show up. They finally show up and they work on him and work on him as they are working on him, Ramona comes home and she is unaware of this scene and situation that's going on. And so she just loses it. She's frantic and doesn't know what's happening. And she said her first thought was, well, if my son who was babysitting the baby is out here, you know, having CPR done, where is my baby? So she said she grabs Maria, they head into the home, and she said they just walked right through the back door. It was not locked. Now, she says um, in one of her um, posts online that 
I guess that wasn't uncommon. They felt like they lived in a very safe community. Um, and, you know, a lot of people didn't lock their doors. A lot of people didn't have video cameras. Um, so I guess it's not too abnormal that the back door might have been unlocked. So they get into the house and she's running around frantically trying to find the baby. And I believe upstairs under a pile of laundry, she sees two little feet sticking out. And she realizes that the baby is asleep in this pile of clothes. And she says, you know, she's trying to wake him up and he's groggy and he's just not acting real coherent. And as soon as he comes to and looks at her, he just bursts into tears and he's just crying frantically. So some of the things she said immediately she noticed when she was going through the house, just at first glance. So she notices on the counter, um, Sean's favorite after school snack was the canned whole peaches and there was one of those in a bowl um, removed from the can but in the bowl but untouched. It wasn't eaten. Um, she noticed that it appeared he started his chores but never completed them. So she said there was two trash bags that he probably went and got from you know the upstairs bathroom or whatever and brought them and sat them there to then finish taking out the trash. So that was sitting there next to the trash can was sitting his shoes upside down. Um, and I believe that's all she said she noticed immediately because she was so fast in and out. She then leaves the house and goes back into the backyard to see what's going on with Sean. And she notices uh, the landscaper is standing out over here with the neighbor that owns the home. And she also notices the neighbor on the other side is outside. They speak to, uh, Ramona speaks to both of these sets of neighbors and ask if they had seen anything. And they both said no. Um, but the odd thing was, is they were working outside during this time period. And so it was very strange that nobody seen what was going on in this backyard with this whole dramatic scene. So, as um, EMTs are working on Sean, they do end up getting um, a very faint heartbeat. So, immediately, they transport him to the hospital. Um, they do not let Ramona ride in the back of the ambulance because they want to continue to be able to work on him. The EMT driver offers to give her a ride to the hospital. By the time she arrives, uh, Sean had already passed away. Um, they had done all they could do, and it had been, um, he had been without oxygen too long, and um, he passed away. So she says she enters the room where Sean is at to say her final goodbyes to her son, and she begins to notice some things with Sean that just aren't quite right or suspicious. She says the first thing she notices about him is he was barefoot and the bottoms of his feet were spotless. And she said, you know, you have those people that just do, I'm one of them, don't walk around barefoot. Outside, inside, nowhere. He was one of those people. He went nowhere barefoot, okay? The second thing she notices is on his right hand between his fourth and fifth finger, she said there was some dried blood. Um, now she says that the police officer or someone wiped the blood off. The police deny doing this, but, um, uh, other things that she noticed was she said his face looked completely normal. Um, like if you would see, um, someone who had been strangled, they might have the petechial hemorrhage, um, some discoloration in the face. Um, and she said he had none of that. She said he just looked like he was sleeping. And, I mean, his face was just, just perfect. So then, she says she um, goes to pull the covers back a little bit. And this is when she loses it. She said she discovers that Sean is not wearing his clothes. 
first of all, he didn't have any pants on, but he did initially. Um, and he said, or she says that he, the clothes he, are wearing, he was wearing was his stepfather's clothing. He was wearing a button-down shirt of his stepfather's, and he was wearing a pair of his stepfather's underwear. Very, very odd. This is just baffling. It's so strange. So, at that time, she kind of, like, something clicks, and she goes, oh, my God, you know, I have people back at the house watching my other kids. I don't think the cops even searched the house to make sure it was cleared and there was, you know, nobody in the house. So she calls, and um, her friend was there watching the kids, and she said, yes, two cops stayed behind, and they did clear the house. They searched it, and there was no one. So after that happens, um, they return, uh, Ramona returns back to the house, and at that time, the police say they're going to start their investigation, and the family cannot enter the home anymore, and that they need to go stay at a hotel for the night. So that is what the family does. Um, some neighbors help them out, bring them some food. Um, they get them set up on the army base um, in a hotel there so they feel safe and comfortable. Um, as they're there, um, everybody's so exhausted from the day and their minds are just racing. And um, something tells Ramona to talk to the baby and just see if, you know, he's two, but, you know, kids will surprise you. So when she starts asking him, you know, what was going on, you know, do you know anything? And he says, one of Sean's friends came over to the house and punched him. Wow. Very, very strange. Okay. So let me get back to... Um, one other person that kind of stands out that was at the scene during all this, you know, how the neighbors come out to watch everything. Well, there was one particular neighbor, a neighbor girl or neighbor lady that kept trying to talk to Maria and she was just in her face. What's going on? What, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then she would wander away from it and come back and, you know, people are telling her, leave her alone. This isn't the time. And she's questioning her, and she's very skittish, and she's acting just weird. And she would walk away, and she would mumble, Oh, it's going to be okay, Maria. It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. And so there's that. Okay, so um, like I said, the family's still at the hotel, and they expect to be there quite a while. Um, days even, possibly. So... It surprised them when they received a phone call at midnight from the police investigators and they said, we're done. You know, you guys can come back and, you know, stay at your house again. They were shocked. You know, it had only been a few hours. And so they do. They want to get back to their home. And they um, get back to the house and they kind of like gather in the living room and they kind of have a meeting and they're talking about just everything that's going on and um, that's when they start to kind of wander around the house and they're just looking at things and they start to notice even more odd things. So in the kitchen, um, uh, right in the middle of the kitchen floor was two trash bags and they were kind of shredded up, like torn up. And what stuck out about these trash bags is Ramona always bought the same exact trash bags every time, and they had um, a red handle on them. But these two trash bags had blue handles, and it was just very, she could not figure out where these came from. She said they ripped through the uh, existing box they had in the house just to make sure there wasn't these oddball colored in there, uh, colored ones in there, and they were all red except for the two blue ones that were found in the kitchen. Um, she said then they uh, really started to look around. She said upstairs in their bedroom, 
um, the mother and father's bedroom, laying on the floor, right in the middle of the floor, was Sean's underwear that he would have worn that day. And they're confused. They can't understand why the police didn't collect this for evidence. Um, they're just baffled. And, you know, they're, they're finding different things like this around the house that they're, um, they can't understand why there's, there's not, none of the black dust around to where they, uh, might have checked for fingerprints. Um, they then go back downstairs and they notice on the back door, glass of the black, back door, a very large left hand print. Very clear and it looked like it had some kind of substance. So... They were just like, oh my God, this is nobody in the family. It's huge. It's a big handprint. So the family, again, makes another call to the police and says, you know, they bagged up this, the underwear and what they could in Ziploc bags. They wore gloves to try to preserve some of it. And they called the police and said, send a patrol car out. you got to come get this stuff. It doesn't even look like you guys searched or did anything. And... They were kind of like real shitty with them, apparently, and um, kind of irritated that they had to come back out, but they do, and um, they come back out and kind of do a second little search, and, you know, they're collecting all these items that the family had found, and they take the handprint off the um, back door, and they question um, the family again and Maria, but they're directing their questions as if this is um, a suicide, okay? And they're not looking at murder. They're just not. This, their mind is set. This is a suicide. This boy did this. Um, I will tell you um, by everyone's account, everyone in that family, Everyone that knows Sean, all of his teachers who all got together and called the family and said, we don't buy this. Sean wouldn't have done this. He had no mental health issues. He, nothing. He was a very happy boy. Nobody is buying it. But this is what the police are saying. This is how they're ruling it. Okay. Um, or I should say the ME rather. Okay. So... Let's get to um, talk about the bag that was found on uh, Sean's head. So this bag um, was kind of, um, I'm not real sure, like a, um, kind of like a sports bag, I guess. It was a, a motorcycle helmet bag, and it had the name Showy on it, or Shoey, and the stepdad said, I recognize that bag. It's one of mine. So he, they go to the garage because they knew that this bag had been in a pile that they um, started uh, building in the garage of stuff that they wanted to take to Goodwill. And he knew this bag had been in that pile. So they go out, they start looking around, and they find um, another bag out there with the missing drawstring which happened to be the one that was um, holding Sean up, suspending him from the swing set. Also found in that same area was several pairs of boots, which had been there, but it looked like um, somebody was trying to unlace them and possibly consider using those strings and then rethinking it and maybe this won't work and looking for a different type of string. Um, so all this stuff is coming to light, right? And they finally, um, convince after just hounding the police department to finally come out and do a second real search. Okay. Now, by the time they do this, it's May 20th, 2022. It is four weeks after the fact. So... Let's just say any evidence that was there um, or could have been there is lost. Um, you know, video that they could have possibly obtained immediately lost. Um, they did put...
put out an announcement asking for any neighbors who had cameras to submit um, video, pictures, anything like that. They did get one video, or I should say a screenshot of a video. And it appears to be from the neighbor who lives directly across the street. And I'm going to show you this, um, this clip that they sent in. It's odd. It is odd. And um, it's just a still shot. And it's like from the front porch directly at the house. You see the landscaper's truck sitting there. Um, there's no people visible in the um, in this screenshot. And it's just odd that they would send that in. Well, when they received that, they then requested that, you know, the neighbor turn over the full video so they can see this. And the neighbor flat out refuses. They will not turn over the video despite several, several attempts by many, many people. Um, this is odd, you guys. I mean, they really need to maybe look into that a little deeper. Um, they also, the police said that they searched his phone, his laptop, and his iPad, and that they found absolutely nothing on any of those devices. Um, they said any and all fingerprints, handprints, they all came back, nothing. Um, they said they tested, you know, all of the um, items forensically, such as underwear, there was no sexual assault. Um, they said they found nothing. Um, and they said that that's why they determined the cause of death that they did, because they did not find any other evidence of anything else. Never mind the state of his body being found. That's your number one evidence, you idiots. Okay, so I just want to kind of talk a little bit about um, some questions that I have. And I'm curious to see what you guys think. Um, and I'm sure you guys all have the same questions I'm thinking of. So, for one, this handprint that was found on the back door. It wasn't found until after the first search of the house had been done. So, how do we know that wasn't one of the investigators? Did they test it? Did they compare it to family, friends, investigators, anyone? We don't know. They never said. They just said it didn't match anybody. My second um, question is the little boy's comment that he made. Now, I understand he's only two, and you cannot base a whole case based on a two-year-old statement, but I think there's something to it. And I think it's worth talking to the child. Have they even attempted to question the child? I mean, at this point, it's way too late. He's a baby. I mean, he's not going to remember anything probably at this point. But, you know, did they even think about that? Um, another question I have was, did he go online and play video games? They said they didn't find anything on his devices, but... Um, I, I take that as they didn't find anything that would lead to something. But I want to know, was he online and was he playing online with friends, video games? Um, because the baby says a friend came over. So was he online playing video games and he pissed somebody off and um, someone came over, a friend, and did this to him? Um, I don't know. There's so many theories. Here is my number one theory that is just going crazy in my head right now, guys, and I haven't seen anybody bring it up. Um, I'm stuck on the fact that he was wearing his stepfather's clothing. I think this is going to be what leads us to the discovery of who did this. I feel like they really need to look into, not stepdad himself, he's not involved, he was away, um, but was somebody out to get stepdad? 
Did he have any enemies? What did stepdad have going on in his life at the time? I think we need to dig deeper there. Um, you know, did he have a secret stalker for some reason? Did a crazy person come into this house with Jared being the target that day? And realizing that Jared wasn't there, but his son was there or his stepson was there and decides, well, he's not here. I'll kill his son. And he's this cuckoo that thinks, okay, I'm going to make this kid dress up like the man I want to be killing right now, like Jared, makes him put his clothes on um, and the bag over the head so that this killer can envision that he thinks he's killing the person he came to kill, which could be Jared, and just some kooky crazy, I don't know, way that, that is just stuck in my head that there's some kind of connection there. Um, there's more to why he's got stepdad's clothes on. If this was not sexual, which the police say it is not, they said it was ruled out, there was no sexual assault. There's more to these clothing. We really need to dig into, or dad, stepdad needs to dig into what was going on around him. Is there something that he um, wasn't aware of or someone that had a vendetta against him that he wasn't aware of or, you know, something to that effect. Um, that is all I have for today's case, you guys. I do want to just add... The family is desperate, like I said, and they have a Facebook page dedicated to getting justice for Sean. It is called What Happened to Sean? And um, go check out this page. Read the thousands and thousands of people that are um, trying to help them get some justice and push for another entity to look at this case, a second set of eyes. Um, go to change.org. There is a petition there that the family has started um, to try to convince them to take a second look at this. Go there, sign that petition. Let's help out this family, you guys. They are absolutely desperate. Um, I am going to end this video by playing a clip of Ramona, and it is just truly heartbreaking. Um, I get teary-eyed just even thinking about it. She's absolutely devastated over this. And we we just need to really do what we can to help push this matter, you guys. Thank you for watching. And I will see you guys on my next video. And I'm going to play this clip for you now. And I'll see you guys on the next video. Bye. Thank you so much for listening to the message. Thank you so much for spreading the message. Thank you so much for standing with us. It makes us stronger. We want to make sure that all the kids in the community are safe because we know that Sean was murdered. Jared and I are very, very grateful and thankful for all the support we have received. It's very hard because we have also smaller kids and they ask questions, you know, and um, it's been very hard. I am amazed daily basis on the bravery. We have tips where people come forward and I can tell they're afraid, but they came forward and they want to share and they want to tell and they know what happened is wrong. They want to make things right. That is so uplifting. Um, that gives me so much strength. And I think at that moment, that is not hard for me. It's hard for them because they have to live with that. And if they cannot stay because they're afraid, that's a bigger burden to carry. Anyone who is trying to help, you can sign the petition, email, call, write, congressman, any legislative, anyone who you think can help or how you guys have been tagging. That's how the podcasters heard about it. I don't know all the podcasters. I didn't even know there's this beautiful community that supports each other so much to talk about 
these kinds of issues, it's amazing. And maybe they do realize, but maybe they don't, how hard it is on daily basis to read about Sean. It is very emotionally intense. Because we are talking about the case, correct? It's like watching a movie and it's a cold case. But then when I slow down, it kind of hits me. It's my son. When it's hard, it was harder for Sean. <laughs> Not for me. He was just 12 and he deserves the justice. Sean was always very simple. He didn't do eloquent, big plans. Simple. He would say, Mom, just fight for me. <laughs>